Amen. Welcome. Church, how are we doing today? Good, good. This is uh, second to the last message of our uh, Spiritual Warfare. This means war series. Next week, Jody will be wrapping it up, and he's going to bring in how the Christmas uh, celebration of the birth of Jesus was just an epic uh, moment in fighting against the works of the devil. So I'm looking forward to that next week uh, as we hear him. And then we have our Christmas Eve services on, on December 24th where I'll be sharing what God's put on my heart for our Christmas season. So, uh, man, this has been a great journey through this series. And today is a really important message uh, for us as a church and really as for many people who struggle or go through uh, the, the attacks of the enemy when it comes to fear, uh, anxiety, worries, and so on and so on. And today is, is personal as well for me. Um, I entitled this message, Trench Warfare. And the reason why is I was doing some research on uh, warfare in trenches, and it was some of the worst, ugliest, uh, t- most terrible experiences in war um, than that than in human history. Uh, trench warfare was really kind of originated by the French in the like mid 17th century, um, but it wasn't really famous or infamous until uh, World War I, between 1914 and 1918, where basically uh, the, the, the enemies were so uh, against each other, they were so close to each other, they had to bury themselves in dirt to try to survive. And we're talking about digging trenches uh, throughout Germany and other places to just um, really hide from artillery fire as much as possible to uh, bullets. And the chaos was just crazy. Um, By the way, 75% of soldiers passed or died because of artillery fire. And then um, you're talking about machine guns and bullets flying over your head. Uh, To make matters worse, there were millions of rats that would come into the trenches during the day or at night. There was what's called trench fever, trench foot. Um, And then one thing that became famous because of World War I was shell shock. And that's where men would seize up in fear and couldn't do anything. And it was uh, considered cowardice because they didn't know what to say or explain what was going on. But it was as they were seized by fear. And this is a tragedy, but the uh, British Army actually um, sentenced 300 some people to death because they didn't know what to do with them. They thought it was like treason. They weren't doing their job. So it was really bad warfare. And when I thought about that, that's actually how it can be emotionally uh, for many people when they go through difficult circumstances is they're seized by fear so much that it's overwhelming. I, I can't imagine being in a, in a warfare uh, situation in a trench and you're hearing warfare nonstop for days. It was so bad that after seven days, they had to take them out and change uh, another battalion to come in or platoons, and they would come in and they replace those men, and those guys would get rest, and then they would do the same thing and come back again because they couldn't handle it psychologically the warfare that was going on. You know, the enemy does a barrage of attacks on us. He uses anything and everything he can use to discourage us, to distract us, uh, to deceive us. And one of the areas I want to talk about today is how he discourages us. Um, This is personal for me because I have been through a barrage of attacks from the enemy of where he, his weapon of discouragement on me. And uh, for many reasons. And what's interesting about it is he will put so much uh, on you. He'll put so many things on you, so many worries, so many fears. Let's say you have like a season of a financial struggle and maybe there's a conflict with someone. Um, maybe, um, maybe your car isn't working right, right? And all of a sudden it just all piles up. Do you know what I'm talking about? When it rains, it pours, right? What's interesting about this is in my personal life, I began to let the enemy uh, cause me to focus on all those things. 
and take my eyes off of God. And what happened was it became so much that it magnified the, the circumstance and didn't magnify my God. And what, what the enemy wants to do is he wants you to get your eyes off of God and focus on your circumstances. And he hopes that you'll make them bigger than what they actually are. And he even wants you to believe that they're actually true. And it can become so overwhelming that you don't know what to do. You're seized by fear and worry, and you have a hard time even connecting with God or hearing from God. And this is what I was going through in my life in, in multiple times, and I can't get too personal of what it was, but all I can say is, is that there were seasons in my life where I couldn't see <laughs> a victory, as we sang today. If you know what I'm saying, say amen. Amen. I'm sure many can relate to these emotional feelings. And sometimes it is physically things going on around us that can cause that. It's interesting though, when I went to my advisors, when I went to my parents or mentors, the answer was connect with God. Get with God in that trench. Dig in deep, don't quit, hold the line. That's easier said than done, isn't it? And the question that I started asking is, is God and my, my mentors, my parents, anyone who were, is there in my corner, I would say, how do I do that? Because it sounds like an explosion went off and just my ears are ringing. You know what I'm saying? Like where, where everything is so bad, you just can't really seem to connect with God. Have you tried to do that? Have you tried to, something's going really wrong and, and you try to go hang out with God and you can't get the situation out of your head? I mean, I've been there. I know what it's like. I mean, for us, we went through a financial well. I'll share this. Uh, we bought a house six months before the crash in 2008. And we literally just... We couldn't believe it, and then we found out that it ended up being a money pit for 10 years. And so for me personally, you know, I had to dig in hard many seasons of my life and pray and ask God for help, and if it wasn't for uh, generous people or, or those who knew my situation and pitched in and prayed or gave, I don't know if we would have been able to make it. And uh, those were many seasons where I began to believe that everything was going to come crashing down on us and we weren't going to be okay. And I had a hard time many times even connecting with God because all I could think about was the struggle. But I truly believe that God gave me something I needed and I wanna share it with you today to help us out. And the scripture that God gave me, which actually ended up being the most read scripture in, in 2019, is Philippians 4, six through seven. Philippians 4, six through seven. And we're gonna read that together. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, what happens is when someone goes through a really difficult circumstance or they're really uh, seized by fear or worry and anxiety, we usually throw a scripture at them and that doesn't always work, does it? Nope. The first thing to do isn't to throw a scripture at someone, it's to love them or L-U-V. Listen, understand, and validate before we start trying to fix their situation, right? And so I went through a season of that where I was like, nothing is working, no scriptures were helping me. I hear someone telling me, go try this, try that, and nothing was working. But what did happen was God was loving me. 
God was listening to me as I hung out with him. God was understanding my situation. God was validating me, and he eventually brought me to the scripture, but he opened my eyes, because I've read the scripture many times, but I truly believe that God opened my eyes to see the scripture differently, and that's what I wanna do today to help us out, okay? So I'm not trying to say that this scripture is a fix-all of every situation, of every attack that the enemy uses for discouragement. And by the way, he uses different columns of, discur- of, of attacks. There's like a, a barrage of artillery fire from the enemy that's under the, the category of discouragement. And that's the one I'm focused on today. But there's other ones where he uses deception. And then the other one is distractions, like the world and the things you can get into. But this one in particular, he will overwhelm you with things. And the scripture that I've countered with is this one. And the first line says, don't worry about anything. And it's true. I had to choose not to worry about the things and one realization or things I was going through. And one realization I had was I can't control outcomes and worrying doesn't determine outcomes. As much as I would worry about it, it didn't change anything. And I had to see that. And it took me a while to notice it. But one thing I can do is I can control how I respond. And the way that God wants to respond is the best way to respond. Now what's interesting is, is that God revealed to me in the scripture that it's like a formula almost or a process to get peace. Because the one thing I was looking for was peace. The one thing I was looking for is relief from thinking about all the stuff in my mind. And by the way, we're talking about the battlefield of the mind today, aren't we? Because a lot of this originates right here, doesn't it? And then it gets into here, and then it gets into your belief that this is what's happening. Oh, no. So I saw this scripture now as a formula or a process to peace. Because if you just read, don't worry about anything, um, you can't stop with that. You have to keep reading. And, And that doesn't fix anything. Just to not worry about something doesn't fix it, does it? To not worry doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have peace. So he wants you to keep going. And the goal isn't, this is really important, write this down. The goal isn't to stop worrying. The goal isn't to stop worrying. The goal is to be at peace. The goal is to be at peace. To dwell on something is normal. To think about things is normal. It's natural. God gave us the ability to, to dwell and think. But what God was teaching me here is to direct my thoughts and focus off the difficult circumstance and now put it on him. So he was redirecting my focus because what the enemy did was he got me to really focus on all the negative and God was like, focus on me. And so don't worry about anything. You're going to dwell on something but now I want you to start dwelling on me. So I kept reading to follow the next instruction from my commander, who is God. And it says here, instead, pray about everything. So don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Praying for God, this is important. Praying for God to remove me from the battle wasn't an option. Yes, I actually said that. Praying that God would remove me from this struggle of fear and anxiety and worry was not actually the option. That wasn't what he wanted me to pray about. I figured out, I figured out this, that removing the fight isn't going to happen. As much as we want the fight to go away, as much as we want the struggle to go away, that's actually not what God wants us to pray about. I believe that God wanted me to pray for him. He taught me to pray differently. He taught me to go through the battles and that God wanted me to come to him through it. Not for it to just disappear, but to go through it and see him work. Why? Because in God's presence is strength that I never thought I could have. In God's presence is fresh perspective on the difficult circumstance that I'm going through. 
in God's presence is fresh endurance, fresh power. In God's presence is actually what I'm looking for. It's peace. What happened was, is every time I went through a battle like this, God taught me something really important. He taught me how to trust in him while he fights the battle I cannot fight on my own. He wanted me to see how powerful he is. He wanted me to see how I can trust him. He wanted me to see how faithful he is. And he wanted me to see him. He wanted me to focus on him through the battle and the storms. How many know that we're going to go through battles and storms in life? It's just the way it is. We talked about that last week. There will be troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus told his disciples. So we have two promises. One, there's gonna be trouble. But two, you're going to overcome them. You will overcome. The key is, is do you focus on God through the battle? And if the enemy, the devil, can get you to not focus on God, you will feel like your world is falling apart. You will feel the despair that he wants you to feel. It will become a truth to you even though it's not true. I went through that. I began to believe that everything was bad and was never gonna get better. And yet, it didn't call for that feeling. The circumstance didn't call for that. The circumstance didn't call for me to go that desperate and to think that way. But that's what the enemy was doing. He was playing games, getting me to take my eyes off of God, forgetting that he is the victor. But that wasn't it, because my commander said next, he wants me to do this, thank him for all he has done. So now we're we're talking about don't worry about anything. That's the first step. The second step is instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need. So you got to go to God. Like you're in the middle of this battle, right? It's loud. It's, it's, It's ugly. Whatever it may be, you put yourself in the circumstance. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. And there's only so much that I can share. But you name it, I've been through quite a bit. You put it in there, it is, this fits. It fits not to worry. It fits to now tell God what you need and trust him with it to give your burdens to him. But then he says, thank him for all he's done? Like you're in the middle of feeling like everything's falling apart and now you're supposed to thank God for all he's done. What is he doing? He's getting your eyes off the struggle. And he's getting your eyes on the goodness of him, on his goodness. So I began to sing songs of thanksgiving. I began to sing songs of praise, and I began to sing worship songs of his promises. And gratitude came to the forefront, and all the worries and fears went to the back. What happened was worship of God, literally singing songs, became a weapon like singing music to God like we just did today became a weapon for me. Worship and praise changed and shifted my perspective. And the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So I was like, okay, if, if God inhabits the praises of his people, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start thanking him and praising him because I need God in this moment right now. There were times I was in a prayer meeting with my brothers and we were praying and we were crying out to God and we were worshiping and praying for each other, worshiping, praying for each other. And uh, I did this alone as well in my home. I've done it in my car. I've pulled over to parks just to get with God, to get my mind off the things that we were going through and to get my mind on God again. And I could feel a shift in the atmosphere of wherever I was, like a literal shift. Like I could tell that peace had entered that place and my heart. And I I have witnesses to that. There was a time where we were in despair about something going on in one of our lives and we were praying for each other. And when we were done, we were all like, whoa, do you feel like an overwhelming joy in this room? And everyone said yes. Everyone left that prayer meeting with joy because we took time to, to give God thanks and praise even though one of our brothers was going through something terrible. 
and we felt a shift in the atmosphere and the presence of God was there. Joy and peace flooded multiple people at one time. How is that possible? It's possible because that's what God promises to happen. And that's the next, next part of the verse. It says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So let me, uh, let me review real quick. I'm going through a difficult circumstance. The circumstance is overwhelming me to the point that I can't concentrate on God. It's hard to hear him. You know, you, when you sit down and you pray and you read the Bible and you re- you'll say you've read it for like a whole page and you don't even know what you read. Do you know what I'm talking about? And that could be simple stuff too. Like, hey, I got a lot of stuff to do. I got to get this and this and this for the kids. I got to go shopping. So it could be even not even a bad thing that that happens to us even when, you know, we're just trying to do our normal day, right? You could be thinking about all the Christmas gifts you still need to get and you forgot what you just read in the Bible. Now, like magnify that by 10 when you're going through something really hard in your family, personally, or pain or loss, discouragement of some sort. That, ma- that gets magnified, doesn't it? And what God is telling us to do is to come to him. What God is telling us to do is to now take our mind off that stuff and to give it to him and then begin to thank him. And because of that, if you go through that sequence or that process, you will experience peace. That's a promise. So I practiced what I read in scripture. I practiced what I was seeing and I believed it was true, so I began to do that. And like I said, we felt joy and peace. I felt joy and peace alone. I did it with fellow brothers in Christ and we felt it together. And what's interesting is the reason why I believe it happens is because the peace that you and I seek is found when we intentionally get our minds off of the worries of this life and get them, get our minds into the presence of God. I truly believe that we can overcome many moments of these fears and anxiety and worries if we pursue the God of peace. I'm confident in that. But what's interesting is they didn't go away permanently. How many of you want that to just go away permanently, right? Well, I'm here to, to pop that bubble and say it doesn't go away permanently. Now, people have experienced freedom from anxiety and fear. Praise God. In this church, it has happened. Praise God. But what happens is, is new circumstances come up, new tests come up, and God has given us a process on how we can handle those things, which is awesome. And so what happened was I found peace, I found freedom from fear, and here's reality, the truth is, there are things that will not shake me anymore because I have learned to fight them with thanksgiving and prayer and and focus on God and worship. And those things will not be able to win against me ever again. And that's the freedom that I'm talking about we can have. But what I'm saying is, is that there's going to be new things that come up. But if we fight this way, we will have a battle plan, a strategy on how to handle them. And so, in other words, they're not all going to go away because new ones come. I want to be clear about that. So what did God teach me to do through this season and many seasons? God taught me to survive and be victorious in the trenches by doing the following. Number one, rely on the commander's orders, which is God's word. Rely on the commander's orders, which is God's word. The Bible says to take captive of every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You know what I've been doing? I've been noticing that something will slip in as negative. I catch it before I let it begin to be a, a, a thought I dwell on, and I go, what does the word of God say, actually? What does the Bible say about that? Well, the first thing the Bible says is don't worry about it, <laughs> right? To give it to God. But then there's a lot of other stuff. 
You're loved, you're forgiven. God is good. We win in the end, right? These are scriptures you're gonna read. And by the way, one of the first things to do when it comes to going through these things, one of, one of the hardest things to do in the beginning is to go to the word of God. It is hard because of all the stuff going on in your mind. So many times I would go to prayer first before I started reading the Bible. And I would begin to do what this scripture says, to begin to pray. And then I would get into scripture when my mind was clear. Philippians 4.8 says this, right after that verse, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Fix your thoughts. Do you know what we tend to do when something bad's going on? We fix our thoughts on that, don't we? And he's saying, fix your thoughts on me, essentially, because that's all God. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Wow. So I began to do that, rely on God's word. And then I would radio for help. I would pray. In Psalm 50, 15 actually says this, then call on me when you are in trouble and I will rescue you and you will give me glory. Worship team, you can come on up because we're gonna come in here and we're gonna, we're gonna come up to the front today to, to worship a song that God gave me through my trial. And it became a prayer as well. And uh, I would radio for help to God. And it actually says, call on me when you're in trouble. God invites us to call on him. He invites us to cry out to him. I was talking to Pastor John about this message. And you know the, do you guys know the acronym ACTS for prayer? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving. It's, it's, it's good. It really helps you in prayer. But when you're in a battle, you're not going through the ACTS process, are you? You're not going, okay, um, A is adoration, uh, C, okay, let me, no, you're just like, help, <laughs> help me, God. I mean, I'm going to get on knees, hopefully I can get back up. <laughs> I mean, this is me in my living room. This is me crying out to God, going, God, help us, please show us something, give us something, God, show us the way. And, and mo most of the time, what I learned was it wasn't to focus on the actual circumstance. It was to just get my mind back on God. And as I kept crying out to God, God was like, just look at me. You're, call out to me. Don't, you know what I was doing? I was asking for the fix instead of the fixer. Did you hear that? God wanted me to be with him. And so he got my attention. God wanted me to learn how to trust him. God wanted, God wanted to teach me how to fight on my knees. So he brought me to my knees. And it was like he was saying, finally, there you are. And I'm going to show up. Because I kept going and moving. I kept doing things in life. I kept trying to fix things. And I was getting in his way. I was getting before the commander, and the commander goes before his soldiers, right? You play something. He invited me to cry out to him. I'm not a baby for doing that. I'm a child of God, and I'm allowed to. Amen. He wanted me to go to him for help. He wants you to cry out to him today. And then I also learned to raise a banner a victory banner, to praise and worship. My mom said this, worship is welcoming God's power into our situation or circumstance. Worship is welcoming God's power into our situation or circumstance. And I would add this, that his presence, that worship is, is welcoming in his presence because in his presence is peace. And worship makes God bigger than your battle it makes your battle smaller and god becomes bigger it's simple it's it's so simple it's ridiculous i began to worship songs or worship god and worship with, through these songs in my house i'll put them on my speaker or on the tv i'll go to youtube and make a playlist and i'll just begin to worship 
And by the time I was done, I didn't even realize how long I was going. By the time I was done, I forgot what I was worried about. I got lost in the presence of God. And next thing you know it, I'm working on my sermons or I'm working on lessons and discipleship groups. And, and I, I was like, wait a minute, what happened here? It wasn't until later on when I started thinking about it because I would, you know, see something that would remind me. And I was like, whoa, I just went through a whole day without thinking about it. Praise God. If, if it has to, worship distracts you from it. If it has to, it, he, God will distract you from those things, but he'll also take it. What it was is I was in his presence and peace. And last thing I did, and by the way, this is the proper way to do this. The last thing you should do is call in reinforcements. Here's why. Too many opinions get in the way. God's voice needs to be louder than anyone else's voice in your life. We need to practice being in the presence of God and hearing his voice before we go to everyone else asking, what do I do? Help me, help me, help me. Well, I flipped it. I went the other way. When I first started fighting this way, I went to people first. And they would always tell me, well, have you prayed yet? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. To be honest with you, I didn't. I asked Sam to play a song today, and I think he actually lost his voice, right? He just lost his voice after his service today, after worship. So we're going to pray for him. But I, I asked them to, to play a song that God used to get me through some really tough moments in the past few years. And so today, would you, would you close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment here? This is a real battle. This is a real battle that the enemy uses. It's a real tactic that the devil uses against us to keep our minds off of God, to paralyze us from serving God, from having peace in our day, just natural, spiritual, regular peace that God wants you to have every day. This is what the enemy does, is he will get you to dwell on everything bad. And God's saying, don't let him do that. If you've been struggling with any of this, and honestly, anything I didn't even mention, we want to pray over you here as we sing this song. And we want these songs. We have two songs. We want, we want to sing these as warfare, as declarations, as a weapon against the enemy. So if you've been going through anything, I want to encourage you to come down here. We are going to surround you in prayer, but we're not going to tell you anything. We just want God to speak. We're not going to command you to do anything. It's God's orders first. And the first thing he wants us to do is not worry about anything and to come to him and give your needs to him and then thank him. And then you will experience peace. Amen? Let me pray. God, move during this time as we worship you. Thank you, God, for getting me through so many battles. And I know how to fight moving forward. I know to dwell on the goodness of you. And God, I know now to give you thanks through every difficult circumstance. To look at all the good going on around me instead of all the bad. To look at your faithfulness instead of my failures or any failures going on around me. I thank you, God, for this powerful word today that we need to apply to our lives. And God, I pray you grant freedom from bondage of fear and anxiety today in Jesus' name as we worship you. And I pray, God, that if any, any new ones come up, that we would know how to fight them and gain freedom from those as well. We thank you, God, that today we know how to fight stronger and wiser. And we also will find freedom from this point forward. We know now how to find the freedom and the peace that you long to give us, that you freely give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So pay attention.